Um, so as Dr. Cahill mentioned, I am a clinical research coordinator at CHOP, so a few blocks that way. And um, we're going to be talking about pregnancy and childbirth for, birth for patients who have had their spine fused. Um, and I'm very happy to see a lot of female patients um, because this will be most applicable to you guys. Um, so sort of as a review of how prevalent AIS is, what we know is that there's about a 2 to 3% um, incidence in children, and this puts us in between as sort of to put into context between diabetes and asthma. Um, so despite the fact that there are a lot of people who are going through the same things as you guys, there's not a lot of research to tell us about um, how this affects pregnancy. Um, so what we do know is this is especially important because um, not only is AIS more prevalent in females um, compared to males, about the ratio is about 11 to 1, um, it's also more severe in females, um, which means that your curves are a little bit um, larger and it progresses um, quicker. So to break down how um, AS patients are treated, about 90% of the curves are mild and they don't require any sort of treatment. Um, on the other hand, 10% require treatment, which is usually a brace. And of that, an even smaller percentage, about 0.1%, um, require surgery. So when you, as many of you guys know, when you prepare for your surgery, there are a lot of different steps that go are involved with that. That's a pre-op appointment with your surgeon, you get x-rays, there's blood work, you meet with anesthesia. Um, and a lot of these have to do with sort of a short period of time involving your surgery and the recovery period. Um, but as you start to recover and think more past your surgery, not a lot of stuff is talked about um, longer term, which includes pregnancy. Um, so what we found is that when patients do ask us about how scoliosis and a spinal fusion will affect um, surgery, some of the questions that they ask are related to how difficult um, their labor will be. Will they, f will they feel more pain? Um, can they get an epidural or a spinal anesthesia, which is um, things that are, as you'll see later in the talk, um, directly inputted into sort of your spinal region. So for someone who has had spinal surgery, this is something that um, is really important for them to think about. Um, other questions include, what type of delivery can I have? Can I have a natural childbirth? Will I have to get um, sort of a C-section? And these are questions that we would like to be able to answer for you guys. Um, so a little bit of background. Despite how common scoliosis is, about 3 million new cases are diagnosed a year. There's only a small amount of information available for patients and surgeons um, to answer some of the questions that we had shown on the previous slide. Um, and the largest series was actually a very local one. It was done while Dr. Betts was at Shriners, and it used a large subset of patients who were from DuPont. Um, and so what Dr. Betts's team found is that for patients who had a posterior spinal fusion, there appeared to be no increased risk of pain um, in their back during their pregnancy. Um, and additionally, the incidence of C-section, which is a type of um, surgical delivery, was about half the national average, and it wasn't related to the mother's scoliosis. Um, another study team that a lot of other um, presenters today have um, mentioned is the Nakamson from Sweden. And in 2000, they published a study, and they found that there was also, like Dr. Betz's team had mentioned, no um, difference in back pain or um, during four patients who were treated surgically for AIS. Um, they did, however, find a higher rate of vacuum extraction, which, as you can see from this figure on the right, is a way where um, the doctor is able to sort of guide the child out of um, birth. Another team um, close to Sweden in Finland, um, this is the bottom one, Ovrum, found that there was no severity and change um, of the curve before and after pregnancy. So that also sort of confirmed what Dr. Betz's team had reported. Um, so while all this previous knowledge is really helpful for surgeons and patients today, it's from what you um, could tell from the previous slide, a lot of it is really out of date. Um, most of the patients were treated with Harrington rods, which are not really commonly used today. It's a sort of a more stiffer construct, um, and today a lot of the surgeons will use pedicle screws um, with those types of rods. Additionally, as I think Don, Dr. Lawner had mentioned, there are now a lot of validated questionnaires um, that provide a little bit more information um, for surgeons and patients that are validated and can provide us with better um, information. So why is HARM study group studying this and um, why are they the best positioned sort of study group to do that? Most of it has to do with the fact that, as you can tell from a lot of the patients that are here today, 81% of the patients in HSG are female, which gives us a good um, 
cohort of patients to study and really um, find the best answers to give you guys. Also, HSD surgeons are active across the world. Um, there are different sort of approaches that they use, and this will provide us with better information. Also, we administer questionnaires prospectively, which means that um, we can sort of track you as you go through your pregnancy, as you go through um, childbirth and delivery. Um, so to do this, the team, as Dr. Cahill mentioned, set out to answer two specific questions. Um, the first one is, what are the long-term effects of pregnancy and childbirth? on quality of life and radiographic outcomes for scoliosis patients who had a spinal fusion. And the second question is, what are the effects on pregnancy and, spi pregnancy and childbirth of having a spinal fusion? So to do that, um, the team identified HSG patients uh, who have either had a pregnancy or are, were in the process of um, delivering the patient or the um, child. And they had them complete a questionnaire about pregnancy and scoliosis. Um, and this questionnaire is shown here, and it really covers sort of the full experience of pregnancy. Um, talks about sort of the counseling that they got with anesthesiologists, um, whether their baby was delivered um, prematurely or full term, um, what kind of anesthesia they got during their delivery, um, and sort of postpartum, uh, what's if they had any complications or what their experience was like. Um, so now I'll sort of go over some of the preliminary results of the patients that we have. Um, so we have a total in our first batch of patients of 23 patients and 32 pregnancies, or 32 babies. So this breaks down to about 1.4 children per mother. Um, so that information is on the left. And on the right, we have a graph that shows um, in the U from the U.S. Census what the average number of children per family is. And Depending on sort of the structure of your family, whether you're married, um, whether there's a mother but no husband present, or there's a father but no wife present, the number of children per family fluctuates somewhere between 1.5 and 2. So we are a little bit below that, um, but this might be explained by the fact that a lot of our ch um, patients are younger and aren't done having um, children. So this is something that we think actually puts us very close to the national average. Um, and so another data point we collected was gestation week, which is um, how many weeks the baby is carried in the womb. And a healthy pregnancy usually lasts around 40 weeks, um, and any baby that is delivered between or before 37 weeks is considered a premature baby. Um, so as you can see, many of the HSG babies were born during that 39 to 40 week period, which is where what you really wanna aim for to have um, sort of a healthy pregnancy and a healthy child. Um, and this is a graph of the census data. So when we compare our data to the most recent data from um, 2014, you can see that both the national average and for HSG patients, most of the babies are born during that full term 39 to 40 week period. Um, and so for an actual birth, people may or may not meet with an anesthesiologist depending on whether you schedule a C-section or you don't, or if you go into labor early. Um, so what we found with HSG patients is that actually the majority, 57%, did not meet with an anesthesiologist. Um, and sort of the most commonly discussed uh, anesthetics that are used during delivery are either a spinal or an epidural. Um, and I'm not sure if you guys can see from where you're sitting, but an epidural is basically where they um, inject the anesthesia into sort of a spinal sac, but not directly into the spine. Um, and the advantage of having epidural is that it allows women to fully participate in the birth experience. Um, you can still feel um, pressure and touch, but it relieves most of the labor pain. Um, in comparison, a spinal um, anesthetic is similar, um, except that it is sort of injected directly into your spinal cord, um, and it's, the effects are felt much faster, and you may feel numb and need sort of more help during your delivery. So in terms of actual deliveries, on the left, you'll see the HSG subset. So this purple section is the HSG patients who had a spontaneous vaginal delivery. So that was 40%, a little bit less than half. Um, and in comparison, the blue one and the green pie are for C-sections. So the blue is patients who had an unplanned C-section, and the green is um, patients who had a planned C-section. So that was a little bit over 50% of patients who had um, some method of a C-section. And again, on the right, you'll see um, sort of the numbers for the national average of how people are delivered. So the top bar is for mothers who had their first child, 
um, or actually for yeah, the mothers who had a first child, the second bars for mothers who had their second, and then third after that. And what you can see from these blue um, bars right here is that as you have more children, the number of um, C-sections that you have increases, or the prevalence of it. What was the prevalence compared to the harm study group? Um, so it fluctuates right here. So um, it was about equal to sort of the national average. So when we asked HSG patients why they had a C-section, 14% um, said that it was um, because they had a previous um, childbirth. So that sort of matches what we were seeing from the national trends in that it increases after, um, as you have more children. Um, and the reason why this is important to study for C-sections is because a C-section is a surgical procedure where um, there might be anesthesia involved, you have a higher risk for infection, um, and the babies are also at a higher risk for what they found is lung um, difficulties. Um, additionally, in sort of a national survey, this wasn't of HSG patients, but just in general, um, they found that almost 95% of women wanted a spontaneous vaginal birth. So, for surgeons and their team, it's really important to help give the patient what they want. Um, so when it comes to childbirth, they will really want, instead of pushing scoliosis patients to go directly to a C-section, um, to hopefully if that's what the patient wants, is to have them go through a spontaneous vaginal birth. Um, so in terms of the C-sections for the HSG patients, um, the type of anesthesia that they received is was 86% um, spinal and 14% epidural. And these are for patients who had a planned cesarean section. So from what we know, these are most likely the parents who had already had a previous child. Um, and on the right, you'll find the data for um, sort of the national average. And HSG patients were actually very close um, to the national average. So 15% had an epidural and 75% had a spinal anesthetic. Um, so Sort of shifting in time to after uh, you have your baby, we surveyed the HSG patients to see what types of um, problems they experience. So what we found is that after childbirth, about 76% of the HSG patients um, had pain, were taking pain medication, 4% um, saw a physical therapist, and another 4% um, did either some sort of special exercise or yoga to help with the pain. Um, and this is very consistent with other non-scoliosis pregnancies. So again, Sort of like what we've um, shown with the other slides is that having scoliosis isn't something that will necessarily make uh, your pregnancy experience that much different. Um, and so finally, we have just an overview of the children is that all the children born to HSG uh, patients were healthy. There was one who had um, lung and heart problems, but that wasn't really associated with um, the mother's scoliosis. So um, I think Dr. Cahill will be able to provide an overview of what we yeah. found. So yeah, thank you. That was that was fantastic. And so I, I, I think what what this work is trying to show is that um, uh, after scoliosis surgery, uh, growing up and becoming a mother and going through the process of pregnancy and childbirth shouldn't really be any different than uh, somebody who has never had scoliosis. Um, one of the concerning things that Michelle touched on was that. Uh, there was a number of patients that were told that they should have a cesarean section just because they had scoliosis surgery. And, um, but those patients that weren't told that had a very similar experience to everybody else that's never had a scoliosis surgery. So it's important for you to really talk with your obstetrician uh, early in your pregnancy about what their feelings are and uh, make sure that they're comfortable uh, with whatever your desires are, meaning some, some surgeons wouldn't consider, or some obstetricians wouldn't consider um, uh, vaginal deliveries. Some of them wouldn't consider epidural anesthesia because in somebody who's had uh, spine surgery before. And our data shows that that's, that's hogwash, that you can have an epidural, that you can have normal uh, vaginal delivery with uh, having scoliosis rods in place. So if your obstetrician isn't comfortable with that, um, talk with your scoliosis surgeon, uh, because each of us, I know I do, I have obstetricians a couple that I work very closely with that are very comfortable with the uh, uh, women that have had scoliosis surgery. And uh, it, I think it's also important to meet with an anesthesiologist early in your pregnancy and go over with them what your expectations are. And one really important thing to do is to keep a copy of your x-rays on a CD so that that uh, anesthesiologist can see where your rods are and make a plan about where they can put an epidural uh, or a spinal anesthetic. 
Um, I don't know if any of the other surgeons have uh, mechanisms in place. Pete? Yeah, so our patients graduated at 21, so I can't see them anymore, and I have this discussion with every single one of them when they turn 20, and they're talking about having an action plan in place for the mm -hmm. uh, And I think it's really important for you to know what level you're fused to. Just like you should know your blood type, you should know you're fused to L1, L2, L3, L4, because that's what the anesthesiologist needs to know. And sometimes your incision extends a lot further down than your fusion level might. So the anesthesiologist might look and say, oh, I don't think this is going to be possible. You're fused down too low. And you might have only a fusion to L3. Also, I think you should have an action plan in place because sometimes you deliver in the middle of the night and it's chaos and you're going to get some resident who's on call that night and he's not going to be the one you met with, <laughs> possibly. So I think uh, these are the things you definitely want to talk to at the very beginning of your uh, process. So I'm going to put the, the moms uh, on the spot. How was, how was if you want, uh, how was pregnancy and childbirth for you? Was it, do you think it was different in any way? So for me, I, I had a particular situation where my curve did progress as an adult. Mm -hmm. So about 15 years after my initial surgery, um, I was going through some pain and I had to have a, a second surgery. Um, but um, a couple years after that, um, I had continued pain and I, uh, I, I started the uh, Schroff method for physical mm -hmm. therapy. Um, and that got me so strong to the point that uh, my, my uh, pregnancy was actually easier um, than most people I know that didn't have scoliosis that never had back issues because the, the whole area that supported uh, the pregnancy was, was primed and strong. Mm -hmm. um, and I actually, uh, I, I had to have a, a C-section, I had to have a planned C-section because I'm um, fused down to L4. Um, um, and so they said that was too low to be able to have the epidural. Um, and I was also nervous about pushing because of uh, issues that I personally have had, not that every uh, scoliosis patient would have. But um, I actually recovered from my C-section much more easy and much faster um, than any of the, the uh, other people that I knew because of the method. Great. Thank you. Yeah, so I think there are some talks in the other room about the Schroth method, which is, um, I refer people over there to that talk too. Yes. Um, I did have spinal fusion. I had the hands in the last place. Mm -hmm. I did meet with an anesthesiologist before, um, right around, I would say, probably 26 weeks. Mm -hmm. And they were more concerned about um, the rods being contaminated with an epidural, so they opted not. So I did have an all around whole childbirth, which was an amazing experience. And I had no problems during pregnancy or even after pregnancy. <laughs> yeah. So, so that's that's one of the uh, uh, one of the issues that we would hope to dispel is that uh, uh, some uh, anesthesiologists don't feel comfortable putting a needle in somebody's back where there's metal because they don't want to put bacteria near that metal. And what we want to what the obstetricians I work with and their anesthesiologists need to know is that your rods don't go all the way down to the bottom of your back, and that there's room for a needle to get in there that won't be anywhere near where the metal is, and the risk of uh, introducing bacteria into that metal is is uh, astronomically low. So, uh, uh, I'd be more worried about introducing bacteria into the epidural space than the yeah, yeah. There is there's the chances of getting bacteria through that needle somewhere where there's nerves near the spine is way higher than near where there's metal. So, that's an example of where maybe the the research that Michelle just talked about can uh, lead to better care for women that have had scoliosis surgery. So, if anybody tells you that same story. Um, uh, talk to your scoliosis doctor and find uh, another obstetrician because it's very possible to have uh, epidurals and, and spinals even if you have metal in your back. Yes, you, you had a thought yeah, or something. I had two children, um, both scheduled C-sections with spinals. I had the easiest pregnancies of anyone I knew. I think it's partially because your ligaments loosen during pregnancy and I think that helps a lot. Mm -hmm. It was also because I kept active and I have made sure everything is very strong. I also had two surgeries before I had my children and one surgery after. And I still had zero complications with either pregnancy, recovery from surgery. I think it's because we've also recovered from bigger surgeries. So it's us. So you're, you're it's the bar is set up. Yeah. It's not as big of a deal outside. So very That's an interesting. Very easy. That's an interesting perspective. Um, Great. Uh, I think with that, we'll move on to our last talk of the morning. Um, the evolution.